Welcome to Grace City Church. We're so glad that you are here with us as we continue our verse-by-verse study on the book of Philippians. I heard a story this week about a man who was having some, some health complications, and so he went to uh, the doctor, and they ran all sorts of tests on him, and when he got the results back, he called the man's wife into the office first, and he said, I, I got bad news. Without treatment, your husband, he, he won't live only a couple weeks, you know? Um, he goes, but with treatment, he can still live a long, healthy life. She said, okay, well, well what's the treatment we gotta do? He says, well, he's got this, this rare form of anemia, and so he can't have any more processed food anymore, and so all of his meals are gonna have to be home-cooked, organic, all right? I mean, we gotta have like a protein, a starch, and a vegetable every single meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. No more junk food, no more ordering out. You're gonna have to cook all of the meals. And your house is gonna need to be spotless, right? Because of his weakened immune system, you're gonna have to keep your house absolutely spotless, clean all the time. And it'll really help if, if you're intimate a couple times a week as well. And as long as you do these things, he could live a happy, fulfilled life. And so she walks back into the exam room where her husband is waiting and, you know, he could tell by the look on her face, he's like, it's bad, isn't it? Uh, well, what did the doctor say? He said, I'm, I'm sorry, honey, but you're not going to make it anymore. You only have a couple weeks. All right, we're not going to live forever, all right? We are all going to die, and when that happens, we're gonna step into eternity. And so today, I wanna talk about experiencing joy in eternity. I brought my passport here with me today. This passport has has enabled me to travel all over the world. Um, Apparently, when I was traveling, um, I had hair, don't have hair anymore, uh, but I had hair in my passport photo here, and so this thing has enabled me to go all over the world. And whenever I go to another country, this passport enables me entry into the country, but it also lets everyone know that I'm not staying there forever. I'm only allowed to stay there for a temporary period of time before I have to travel back. And this passport ensures that I have access back to the United States of America. Now, if you're not an American citizen, you can become a citizen by taking a citizenship test And then after that, I think, well, first of all, I think everyone should have to take a citizenship test because everybody I've met who's become a citizen that way, they actually know more about our country than the people who are born here. So I think this citizenship test should be something required for all of us here. But after the test, there is a pledge you must make. And the pledge says this, I hereby declare an oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereign whom or which I have heretofore been a subject or a citizen, that I will support and defend the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by law, that I will perform non-combatant services and the armed forces of the United States when required by law, that I will perform work of national importance under civilian direction when required by law, and that I take this obligation freely and without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, so help me God. So in order to become a citizen of the United States, you have to renounce your allegiance to every other government or entity. You know, the idea of dual citizenship is something relatively new. It came about in the 60s. But before then, if you wanted to become a citizen here, you had to completely reject or renounce the government that you were previously under. And the same is true in the kingdom of God. If you want to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you have to renounce your allegiance to every other kingdom and pledge your complete devotion to Jesus Christ as Lord. And I say all this because the passage that we're going to look at today is known as the citizenship clause of the New Testament, where in Philippians 3.20, the Apostle Paul says that as believers, we are citizens of heaven. 
Now, the idea of citizenship would have had a, a significance to the Philippians because Philippi was a Roman colony. So although Philippi was in Macedonia, the people living there didn't dress like Macedonians. They dressed like Romans. The primary language they spoke wasn't the language of Macedonia. It was the language of Rome. All of their customs, practices, traditions, and way of life resembled Rome, not Macedonia. And so everything about their life was influenced by their citizenship, not the country they were living in. So the Philippians understood what it was to be a citizen of one country while living in another. And so when the Apostle Paul says that we are citizens of heaven, they understood that that means that our heavenly citizenship supersedes our earthly residence, that we should not primarily think of ourselves as Romans or Americans, but primarily as citizens of heaven, that our ultimate allegiance is to Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he takes it one step further and he says that we are ambassadors of heaven, right? So, so, so we, we are not just like citizens just touring this world, but we are actually here on assignment. We have a job to do. And so we are not to think like this world or act like this world because we are citizens of heaven here on assignment sent to colonize earth. We are here to bring the customs and culture of heaven to earth. Our mission is to bring heaven to earth, that any place that does not look like heaven and our job is to establish the kingdom of God in that place. But when we forget that we are primarily citizens of heaven, when we forget that, we get caught up in the things of this world. We start to think that this world is our home, and we begin to place the temporal above that which is eternal. And so we have to remember that we're only here for you know, between 70 and 90 years, and then we enter into eternity. And when you understand how short your time here is on earth compared to how long eternity is, it changes your priorities. And so God wants us to live with the proper perspective on eternity so that we make the most of our time here on earth. And when you understand your citizenship, when you understand that you are ambassador, it changes the way you live. It changes the way you spend your time. It causes you to live with the proper priorities. See, so many of, of, of the confusion and problems that, that we run into as believers, it's often because we don't understand our citizenship. You know, people ask me all the time, they're like, oh, Josh, what, what do you think about this? What, what's your opinion on this? I'm like, well, my opinion doesn't matter. Your opinion doesn't matter either. The only opinion that matters is God's, right? The only thing that matters is what does God say? Because as ambassadors, ambassadors don't represent their own thoughts and opinions and feelings about issues. No, they simply speak on behalf of the nation that they represent. They're here to say, this is the stance of our government, right? And so as ambassadors of heaven, we are to speak and act on behalf of heaven. So what I think and feel doesn't matter. And as believers, we get into trouble when we go, well, I just don't think. Well, I just feel. None of that matters, right? You're an ambassador. You're a citizen of heaven. Look, when you became an American citizen, you did not get to come up with your own constitution. You have to embrace the Constitution of the United States. And when you become a citizen of heaven, there is a constitution called the Word of God. You can't amend it to fit your preferences. You can't modify it to fit your weaknesses. You can't uh, adjust it to fit your experience in life up to that point, and you can't change it to line up with your compromise. No, you have to change your thoughts, attitudes, and actions to line up with the Constitution of God's Word. Right. Amen. Or Omi, which one? Where, where? Verse 27, it says, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. So our citizenship should be the lens through which we view all of life. Every decision we make must be filtered through the lens of our citizenship. So if the ethic of heaven is others first, then I must live in others first life. If heaven esteems honor, then I must treat everyone I meet with honor and respect regardless of whether they treat me with honor and respect. If heaven values generosity, then I must be generous with my time, talent, and treasure. If heaven prioritizes holiness, then I must prioritize holiness holiness in all aspects of my life. I know nobody preaches holiness anymore, but it still matters to God, right? He said, be holy for I am holy. As citizens of heaven, we are to embody the values, priorities, and conduct and ethics of heaven on earth, right? Which means the word of God must dictate the way I walk, talk, and live. So as citizens of heaven, our conduct should match our citizenship, 
As citizens of heaven, our conduct is supposed to match our citizenship. And this is why the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians and he went, wrote to them to remind them of their citizenship and to instruct them on how to live as citizens of heaven. He said this in verse 17, which is the passage we're going to look at today. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. So if you want to live as a citizen of heaven, you need to spend time with other people who are living as citizens of heaven. You know, when I was a youth pastor, I would tell our students all the time, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. How many know that's not just true for teenagers, right? It's true for all of us, right? Show me your friends, I will show you your future. We become like the people we spend time with. This is a spiritual and sociological fact. And so if you don't have a group of people in your life who are seeking to embody the values of heaven, who have a heart for God, who are pursuing the things of God, you're going to be in trouble. In Africa, there was a, a herd of elephants that became too populous. And so what they did is they took all the young elephants from that herd and they moved them to a new location. And, and, and where they moved these new elephants, there were white rhinos in that region. And all of a sudden, these white rhinos started dying. And they couldn't figure out why they were dying. And then they discovered that these young elephants were killing all the rhinos in that region. And, and then these, these white rhinos, they moved from, from uh, sorry, these elephants moved from killing white rhinos to attacking tour buses, right? And they're like, man, these elephants are out of control. And so they started to shoot these elephants to try to thin the herd because they thought, well, maybe there's just too many of them. But it didn't work. Nothing was working. These elephants were out of control and they could not change their behavior. They could not get them to act right. And so finally... In a last-ditch effort, they decided to, to take some of the older, more mature elephants from another herd and kind of inject them into this herd of young elephants, and it immediately fixed the problem. Immediately they changed, which means these young elephants didn't know how to act day in and day out without the example of the older, more mature elephants. And what's true in the animal kingdom is true in the kingdom of God. Right? We need the example of older, more mature believers. We need the example of those who have been walking with God longer than we have. We need people who conduct themselves as citizens of heaven to be our example of what it looks like to live for Jesus. And this is why our church is built around small groups. We are not a church with small groups. We are a church of small groups. And so all the ministries in our church flow through small groups. It's where you find community. It's where you build life-giving relationships with other people who are seeking to embody the values of heaven. And today is the launch of that small group semester. And so our summer semester is a short semester. It's only six weeks, which means it's the perfect time to jump in and join a small group. Because if you don't like the people in the group, it's okay. It's only six weeks, right? <laughs> You're going to be on vacation for a couple of them. So really, you probably only got about three or four times to hang out with these people. So if you don't like them, you're not going to have to spend 10 weeks with them like in the fall, right? So this is the best time for you to jump in, join a group, and find your fit here at the church because we were never created to do life alone. We need community. That testimony that you heard today is the perfect example of how we need other people who are seeking to live for Jesus in our lives. Verse 18. For as often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is their shame, their mind is set on earthly things. I don't know if I've ever heard anybody preach from this verse, and there's a reason, right? This is a terrible verse, but when you're doing a verse-by-verse -verse study through the Bible, you don't get to skip over it, so you got to talk about it, right? There's a reason why topical preaching is so popular. It's because we just avoid all those really difficult, hard sayings in the Bible. You know, um, in, in my passport, it says that it is unlawful for anyone else to use this passport. It, it says that this passport must not be mutilated or altered in any way. Now, why would they put that, that warning in there? Because someone might be tempted to take my passport, cut my picture out of it, and put their picture and use my passport. And that's exactly what was happening in Philippi. There were a group of people that tried to pass themselves off as citizens of heaven, but their passports were fake. They called themselves Christians, but they weren't actually following Jesus. And so there are two groups that he addresses in Philippians chapter 3. The first group that he talks about are the Judaizers. These were kind of the religious 
legalists, all right? So these people taught that you are saved by faith in Jesus and by your good works. And so if you want to be saved, you have to believe in Jesus, but you also have to keep the ceremonial law of the Old Testament. And in the very beginning of Philippians 3, Paul addresses this group and he calls them dogs, evildoers, and mutilators of the flesh because they actually taught that you needed to be circumcised in order to be saved. Thank God we're not under the old covenant law anymore, all right? That is no longer a requirement for salvation. Can I get it? Amen. All right, yes, that is not a requirement. You don't have to be circumcised in order to be saved, but that's what these people were preaching, which is problematic to the gospel moving, right? I don't, I don't, let's imagine if that was part of our membership class right there. All right, discover. All right, step two. Here we go. Bring out the knife. Like, no, no one is going to go through that class. Right? That's what was happening at these churches, right? Which is just absolutely crazy. But then there's another group that he addresses, and we, nobody talks about them a lot, but they were the Gnostics. And so the Gnostics were kind of the exact opposite of the Judaizers. They practiced antinomianism, which means against the law. So they rejected the idea of obedience to God. And so they taught and believed that your, your spirit, your heart is the real you. And so it doesn't really matter what you do with your body. And so as long as you believe in Jesus, you can live however you want. The Old Testament doesn't matter. The New Testament doesn't matter. What the writers of the Bible said, what Jesus said, well, all the laws, all the commands, none of those things matter because as long as your spirit is aligned with God, as long as you believe in Jesus, you're saved. You can do whatever you want to do. This was their message. Now, both groups are still active and, and present in churches today. In fact, when I moved to Albany 15 years ago, I would say that, that it was probably leaning towards the, the Judaizers. It was probably leaning towards the, the religious you know, teaching of it. But I think today we're experiencing a massive shift in Christianity towards Gnosticism. Now, it's not called Gnosticism anymore. It's gone by different names over the years. But today it's called progressive Christianity, which believes that you can do whatever you want because Jesus loves you. And so they love Jesus, but they hate his truth. And so they decided just to separate Jesus from his truth, Jesus from what he actually taught, which you can't do because the Bible says that Jesus came full of grace and truth, and you can't separate the two from each other. They go together, but they don't like what Jesus said about how to live and what to do with our sexuality and all these other things. So they decided, you know what, let's just separate these things completely. And so they love love, but they don't love truth. And so their primary value is not being true to God's word, it's being true to yourself in your truth. They call good evil and evil good good and they are not citizens of heaven. They may talk the talk, they may, you know, use the same language, they may sing the songs in church, they may even engage in other Christian activities, but they are not following Jesus. They are idol worshipers who've made a god according to their image and their likeness. Right? This is what it says in Matthew 7:21. If you open this and read this in your Bible, it would be in red letters because Jesus said that. Loving, kind, compassionate Jesus, right? Jesus holding the little baby, you know, sheep in his arms, Jesus. This is what he said, right? So this is not my thoughts or my views or opinion. I'm just going to read directly from Jesus. Not everyone who says to me, "Lord, Lord," will enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoa. So not everybody who calls Jesus Lord, who claims to be a Christian, is actually a citizen of heaven. Well, then who are the actual citizens of heaven if it's not the people who are professing Jesus as Lord? He says, only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So it's not enough to simply profess Jesus as Lord and not abide by his word. You actually have to, to walk out the will of God as revealed in Scripture. You have to have the conduct to match your citizenship. And so Paul calls these people who live this way, who profess Jesus with their lips but deny him with their lives, he calls them enemies of the cross. That's even stronger language, right? He, enemies. He's the, they call themselves Christians. They're actually enemies of the cross, and their destiny is destruction. Whoa. Right? He said, no, no, their destination is not heaven because they are not true citizens. They are fake citizens, and their destiny is destruction. And this is what he says. He has three earmarks of these false citizens. He says, number one, their God is their stomach. The stomach it was an ancient euphemism for your bodily cravings, your desires, and specifically your desire for food, sex, and pleasure. 
He says, their God, their Lord is not Jesus. Their God is their desires and passions. That is what they obey. That's what they submit to. That is what dominates and rules their life. It's not Jesus. They have not submitted their biology to their theology. No, their biology is what rules their life. Ooh, that was good. Someone needs to write that down. I didn't say that in any other service. Come on, you got to submit your biology to your theology, right? Jesus must be Lord, not your cravings and desires. I will amen myself up in here today, all right? It gets worse, don't worry. Number two, their glory is in their shame, right? Now, we all sin, right? Like, nobody's perfect. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. I'm not preaching sinless perfection, right? God is more concerned about your direction than your perfection. So, so none of us get this perfectly, but we are heading in the right direction, right? When you, just, when you are comfortable and content in it, their problem was that their glory was in their shame, right? They flaunted their shame. They bragged about their sin. They Instagrammed their sin. They don't hide it. They celebrate it, and they are proud of it. And then number three, their mind is set on earthly things. If they had a catchphrase, it'd be YOLO, right? You only live once. Now, we know that's not true. You don't only live once. You you live once in this life, and then when this life is over, you step into eternity, and you live all over again, Right? But they don't think about the life that is to come. It's all about the here and now. Everything is about instant gratification, doing whatever feels good in the moment with no thought of eternal consequences. And these p- believers, these people who call themselves Christians, are still active and prevalent in churches today. And I'm seeing a scary trend in Christianity that is moving towards this direction. We're seeing it everywhere we go. And I understand that this is not popular preaching, but that's okay. I'm not running for office. They didn't vote me in, they can't vote me out. All right, I'm here to discharge my duty as a pastor to shepherd and watch out for your soul, to guard against these doctrines of demons that are infiltrating churches and are destroying people's faith. But our citizenship is in heaven. It gets good. We're over the difficult part. This is the good news of the message today. Our citizenship is in heaven. In other words, we don't set our minds on earthly things. Our mind is set on eternity. We understand that we are here on assignment to bring the rule and reign of heaven to earth. So we live with heaven's priorities, heaven's values, and a mindset on heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are to live this life eagerly awaiting the return of Christ, right? Theologians call this the imminent return of Christ, meaning Jesus could come back at any moment in time. And so we are to live with the awareness, with the reality that at any moment Jesus can come back, right? And so if you knew that Jesus was going to come back, let's say end of the month, how would your life change? Outside of quitting your job, I think we'd all quit our jobs, all right? But, but how would you change? What would you stop doing? What would you do differently, you know? Like, like what, what in your life would change? Because when Jesus comes back, like, like everything we do should be viewed in light of how this is going to matter in eternity, right? So if you knew Jesus was coming back, the imminent return of Christ, what would shift in your priorities so that the life you're living right now actually makes sense in the light of eternity, I love 1 John 3 says this, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in his appearing purify themselves just as he is pure. Right? When you live eagerly awaiting the return of Christ, knowing he could come back at any moment, it is a motivation to live for what truly matters, which means that heaven is not just our destination, it's our motivation right? The anticipation of his coming, that when he comes, he is ushering us into our eternal home, is our motivation for living holy and blameless lives. Verse 21, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will become like his glorious body. Oh, come on, somebody. When Jesus comes back, these bodies are getting an upgrade. Come on, that's good news. Right, we're getting new glorified bodies. I don't know how it's all gonna work. I don't know if it's like an assembly line. I'd be like, ooh, I like his hair. I'll take those biceps, his hair, right? I, I don't know how it's all gonna work, but it's definitely gonna be better than what I'm working with right now, all right? That's what I know for sure, right? We're getting new glorified bodies when Jesus comes back. I'm getting an upgrade, all right? Second Corinthians chapter five, the apostle Paul calls our earthly bodies tents. 
Do you have any people here who love camping? Do any, any, any people love camping? Where are my campers at? Yeah, don't be ashamed. Raise your hand. If you're a camper, be proud of it. I mean, I don't get it. It's absolutely crazy to me that anybody would do that. Like, hey, you want to burn some vacation days sleeping outside on the ground? Like, nah, I'm good. You know? It's like, dude, yeah, you get to go to the bathroom in the woods, you know? Figure out how to go standing up, all right? It's going to be a blast. You'll wake up in the middle of the night freezing with bugs crawling on you. Let's do it. No, 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 I'm okay. You know, like, I, I don't understand the allure of camping. I don't know why anybody would do it. People are like, oh, you don't understand. It's like a tradition in my family. Well, yeah, it was a tradition in everyone's family until they invented houses, right? Well, that's where everybody, everybody camped. <laughs> until air conditioning and homes and all these things. Like, if it's so great outside, why are all the bugs trying to get into my house? <laughs> that's why no one uses the phrase happy camper in a positive way. It's always sarcastic. Well, he's a happy camper. It's because there's no such thing as a happy camper. The only happy campers are the people leaving the campground because they actually get to take a shower. That's it. Closest thing I'll ever do to come to camping is watching the show Survivor, right? Remember that show? I think it's like still on. I watched season one of Survivor. Like that's the closest I'll ever come to camping is like Survivor, right? Because they're paying you to camp at least, right? I think if you win the show, you get like a million dollars. That's not enough money for me to do it. Um, uh, <laughs> right, if I have to wake up in the morning and hunt down my own food, you're gonna have to give me a whole lot more than a million dollars, right? You ain't gotta vote me off that island. I'll put out my own torch and be like, all right, I'll see y'all later. I'm going home, y'all head back to camp. <laughs> that is not enough money for me. Right? But even those who love camping, they only love it for a little while, right? Because after a few days, right, all, all your clothes smell like campfire, and you start to smell, <laughs> right? Like, you know, your back starts hurting from sleeping on the ground. Your tent starts sagging. That's an accurate description of our earthly tent, right? Our bodies, right? After a while, they start to smell. <laughs> Back starts hurting, aches and pains, right? Start sagging in certain places. <laughs> that's, what the, that's the language the Bible uses, right? Calls these earthly bodies tents because tents communicate temporary dwelling places. Yet we get so preoccupied with our tent and how it looks. There was a survey where they asked people, hey, if you could change anything about yourself, what would it be? The overwhelming majority said something about their physical appearance. They wanted to be taller, thinner, straighter hair, or hair at all, you know, like straighter teeth, right? They wanted to change something about their physical appearance. Like, we're, we're, we're so preoccupied with our bodies. Even when we die, we're still preoccupied with our body. You know, as a pastor, I do a lot of funerals and you know, probably about, you know, 50-50 or, or open casket. And it's always, you know, fascinating to me to, to be there and to see, you know, family members and friends and loved ones walk up to the casket and go, oh, he just looks so good. He just looks so good. I'm like, he looks dead. <laughs> he looked better a week ago when he was alive. I've never seen him with this much makeup. Like, no, his cheeks were never that rosy. He, this, this doesn't look good, right? But even when people die, we're, we're obsessed with how they look. Oh, he, he just looks so good. He just looks so good. Like, okay, he's not here anymore. He's gone. Why are we painting bodies? It's weird. All right? If you want to go out that way, that's cool. I'm being cremated. All right? God's going to have to find the pieces of my body to resurrect when I get my glorified body. But, uh, right? But even in, in, in death, we're preoccupied with our bodies. We have to remember, look, these things are just tents. When Jesus comes back, we're receiving new glorified bodies that have zero fat cells. Come on, you can eat whatever you want and not gain weight. Glory to God. This is the part where you can amen. This is the good news, right? Unlimited, no ketos, no diets, no whole 30, none of that stuff, man. Whatever you want, you get it and you don't gain weight. We're getting glorified bodies free from the effects of sin, free from aches and pains, free from sickness, disease, and decay. So don't get so caught up in your earthly tent. Don't, don't get caught up in the things of this world. Don't think only about this life. Don't focus only on that which is temporal and lose sight of that which is eternal because this world is not our home this world and everything in it is passing away and when it does we step into eternity and only what we do in life that matters in eternity that we get to take with us in 1952 Florence Chadwick attempted the 26 mile swim from the coast of California to Catalina 
Island. And, and so she traveled with a team of people that were in a boat, and their job was to kind of watch out for sharks and, you know, help her out in case of cramping and fatigue, in case she couldn't make it, they would, she'd hop in the boat and they'd take her to the shore. And so 15 hours into her swim, hours, yeah, 15 hours into her swim, a thick fog began to set in over the coast, and so she lost sight of the shore. At this point, she'd already you know, been fatigued. She was just exhausted, and she didn't think she could go any longer, but she continued to swim for another hour before she said, I, I can't do it. I can't swim anymore. And so she got into the boat, and they headed to the shore. And as soon as they, they cut through the fog, she realized that she was only one mile from the shore. She gave up one mile short of actually reaching the shore. Two months after her failed attempt, she tried again, and the same thing happened. Thick fog set in, causing her to lose sight of the shore, but this time she didn't give up and quit. She continued to swim until she finally reached the shore. As she made it to the shore, the uh, interviewers and newspaper reporters, they were all there, and they said, what was the difference between the last time and this time? She said, I kept in my mind a picture of the shore, and I kept swimming toward it. So as we live here on earth, let us keep a picture of eternity in our minds and swim towards it. Amen? Amen. If you guys would bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, maybe you're here and you professed Jesus as Lord, but you never actually abide by his word. You've never actually done the will of God. Not that you're perfect because none of us are but you've never submitted your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You want the benefits of the cross without carrying your own cross. If you're here and that's you today, I wanna to give you the opportunity to enter into a relationship with God because he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, who died on a cross for our sin, was buried, and three days later, he rose again so that by believing in him, you could be forgiven. You could have a fresh start. You could have a relationship with God here and now, but it starts by acknowledging him as the Lord, the leader of your life, and surrendering your life completely and totally to him. In exchange, you get eternal life. You get a relationship with God. You get the hope of heaven when this life is over. But it means laying down your own will and desires to follow after him. And so if you're here today and you're ready to make that decision, I'm not gonna single you out or embarrass you or ask you to come forward, but I do wanna pray for you today. So if that's you and you're ready to make that decision, just slip your hand up in the air right where you're at. Thank you, I see, I see that hand. Anyone else here today? Thank you, I see that hand. Thank you, I see your hand. Anyone else here today? Thank you in the back, I see your hand, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, put your hands down. God, I pray for those who lifted their hands in this moment, God, who are surrendering their lives, holding completely to you. God, I pray that they would know that there's nothing they can do to earn this salvation. It's a gift that is freely given to us when we, we trust in you. God, I pray that, that you begin to change and transform their hearts. Change them from the inside out, God. Give them a heart, a desire to live a life that glorifies you and honors you in all that they do. Empower them by your spirit to overcome the challenges that they're up against when they leave this place. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we put our hands together for those who made decisions to follow Jesus? We are so excited for you. And we would love for you to stop by our information tent, which is just right outside uh, this door, sorry, desk, information desk right there. Uh, we want to give you this book called Fresh Start to help you get started in this new journey. If you guys would stand to your feet, I went over, let me pray over you real quick. Uh, when I end my prayer, if you're here and you need, specifically need prayer for anything at all, our prayer team is here. We'd love to pray with you and believe God for you. So don't leave here if you need prayer today. Let me pray. God, I pray that today, God, our eyes would be lifted off of the temporal, we begin to focus on that which is eternal, God, that we would all make the, the adjustments that we need in our lives to, to live lives that actually make light, uh, make sense in light of eternity, that we would live for the things that truly matter, that we wouldn't get caught up in temporal things and things that are passing and fading away, but we would live for that which lasts forever. We would live for your renown. We would live to make you famous, that we would embrace our role as ambassadors, that we would bring heaven to earth everywhere that we go, that on Monday morning, we'd bring heaven into the office. When, when we go home, we'd bring your peace and your joy and your goodness everywhere that we go. May we embrace 
embrace our assignment and not run away from it. May we embody the values, the priorities, and the ethics of heaven. May we have the, the conduct to match our citizenship as we glorify you in everything that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen.